Yes, we, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm the voice from above today. Um, and before I even get started, I wanted to apologize in advance. I have a terrible, terrible cough. If I need to put myself on mute, I will. Um, I haven't gone anywhere. Okay. Um, so my name is Kristen Dancy. I am an associate director at the ECRI Penn Medicine Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, uh, ECRI Institute is one of um, about a dozen EPCs, um, and one of the things that we do is we do systematic reviews that underpin um, clinical practice guidelines. And I know we're not supposed to be spending too much time doing introductions, but before I started at ECRI, um, I was a scientist, and I've done everything from rat research up through human research. Um, my training is in neuroscience, and I am, um, I've done many years of research in nutrition and behavior laboratories. Um, and so this is uh, an exciting opportunity for me to talk to you today, so thank you very much. So. Clinical practice guidelines are statements that include recommendations that are intended to optimize patient care, that are informed by a systematic review of the evidence, and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. Um, and what I did today and yesterday is I've, I've learned so much and had originally started out taking a ton of notes trying to think of um, how I was going to incorporate all of these wonderful talks into this wonderful clinical practice guideline talk. And I realized that that just wasn't going to be feasible. Um, and so what I did want to talk about um, is what I did do is I identified some challenges in translating the research and, um, you know, how we, we might get to better patient care. And I can't promise that I have any answers for you. I might just give you more questions to work with. But there are definitely things that we want to think about. Um, the first of which, uh, nutrition interventions are complex. Um, my people have talked about, you know, giving maybe one nutrient or a cocktail of nutrients. And, um, you know, whatever we're doing for nutrient intervention has to be considered with the context of the diet as a whole. And from an evidence standpoint, um, we have to remember that when we're looking at nutrient interventions, that it's not the same thing looking at a drug study, um, even though the, the, the designs might be similar. I think Denny brought up a very good point about um, the signal-to-noise ratio um, and how a nutrient intervention is going to be, could be somewhat weak. Um, you know, we have to remember that nutrients aren't being given in a vacuum, people are eating, um, doing other things, they may not be compliant. Um, and so when you're thinking of a systematic review that's going to inform clinical practice, um, you need people who are going to be well informed about what the concerns are. Um, you know, you need to have content experts, you need to have people on there who know, um, you know, what's the appropriate way to answer the question. And another thing I noticed is that many of the disease states uh, within this workshop are pretty rare. And within a small patient population, um, you've got the additional complications of heterogeneity, um, or you might have something that might change across age, as well as the disease state, um, what other factors are going on in the diet, um, environment, genetic makeup, what have you. And then finally, um, and this is what I wanted to talk about specifically, is uh, for many of these things, you have a, a tremendously limited evidence base. Um, I hear people talking about the paucity of large-scale studies, the paucity of RCTs, um, the angst over the lower grade ratings that might be related to this. I, I think uh, forget about it was a, one thing referred to uh, with the grade uh, yesterday. Um, you know, because we, we have some considerations with study design and optimal information size. And GRADE does make provisions for considering more than RCTs in a way that lets you make good clinical decision making. And as other people have brought up, RCTs might not, not be the optimal or ethical way in examining some questions. So talking about evidence-based practice um, in a very generic sense, your first step is to formulate a question your PICO. Um, you search systematically, you search the literature for relevant articles, you evaluate and appraise the evidence for its validity and usefulness. Um, so the process of conducting your systematic review. And then your guideline panel will work and implement useful findings and help, hopefully translate those into clinical practice. So the systematic review that's being done to, undertake, uh, to support a guideline 
has to be done in a way that facilitates decision making and you have to then consider using what's called a best evidence approach. Um, you know, a, a systematic review that's going to be used for a guideline is going to be different from, say, a Cochrane review, which is done to sort of give an idea of the state of the science and whether or not an intervention works. And typically, Cochrane reviews focus only on randomized controlled trials. Um, and in reality, if you're, if you're going to be doing a guideline development, you have to be able to give people an answer and a way to manage their patients. So I'm going to talk about this within the umbrella of GRADE. Um, I know GRADE is a thorn in some people's side, but it is a very common way now in guideline development, and uh, many frameworks sort of get at the same sort of thing, um, but GRADE is, is pretty well documented. And the important thing to remember is that GRADE does provide a separation between the quality of the evidence for an outcome, all right, so what you're looking at within your systematic review, and then the strength of the recommendation for your intervention. Okay, and that's going to be discussed and, de and decided upon by your guideline panel. And as a reminder, um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but grade ratings of high, moderate, low, and very low really just kind of talk about our certainty in the evidence and how certain we are that what we're seeing is the true effect or, or whether or not we think that what we're seeing in studies, if they're very low quality, um, may end up being not really reflective of the true state of things. So this is a, a famously busy slide from GRADE, but it gives an idea of the whole process, the life cycle of a uh, guideline and how it's developed. And again, you begin with formulating your question at the beginning, and during this, you see that you can um, select your outcomes and then you rate them as what's critical and important and not important. And then you rate these outcomes across studies, and then you rate your confidence in the quality of the evidence. Um, and so uh, we are all familiar with where we can grade down, and I may not have time to get to it, but we also have places where we can grade up. And for a lot of the research described within um, the, the past couple of days, you know, when you're looking at maybe small numbers of studies, your observational studies, um, case series, you might want to be in a situation where you think about how you can grade things up. And you grade your quality of the evidence. Your systematic review is now over, and you go to your guideline panel. And your guideline panel then works with the evidence and considers a whole host of issues besides just the evidence itself, including the balance of benefits and harms, um, patient values and preferences, and other factors, and use those to make a recommendation for or against something, and it can be weak or strong. And then your guideline is then... Um, magically developed and gets released out into the wild where we are hoping that then our clinicians are able to then uh, take those guidelines and apply what has been recommended within them. So um, one of the things that I wanted to mention here, it's relatively new, GRADE is evolving. Um, GRADE, you know, much like any other process, is, is a work in progress. and. Um, you know, it's more about rating your, your RCTs as high and everything else as bunk. Um, Hassan Murad um, and his group have done a number of um, papers looking at things where, you know, what are you going to do if you don't have a lot of evidence? You know, you have to make a recommendation about what to do with your patient. And so this is a fairly new paper, and I apologize, I haven't even had a chance really to read it myself. Um, but this is interesting. It's how can you look at the methodological quality and synthesis of case series and case reports and use them to inform a clinical guideline. And this is going to be particularly important where you have a rare disease or where you have a rare, um, you know, rare outcomes. Um, and so they actually suggest that you can um, look at the body of evidence from case studies. And within the um, paper, he does describe a couple of different ways for evaluating the quality and um, of case reports and case series. And um, considerations include whether or not your patient actually represents, um, you know, the, the whole experience of the investigator, or did they kind of cherry pick some patient who was going to do well? Um, was the exposure and the outcome, were they adequately ascertained? And then causality, you know, were there other alternative cases that might explain the observation? Or is there a challenge or rechallenge phenomenon? Um, is there a dose response effect? Um, was the follow-up long enough for outcomes to, to occur? 
so there's a lot of different um, ways to look at the evidence and then um, hopefully then be able to take it and apply it to your population. Um, so when you're thinking about assessing the quality of the evidence, um, particularly with observational studies, is you see that they do start out as an initial rating of low. But you do have some instances where you can upgrade that, and they are related to um, a large magnitude of effect. Um, if you have uh, large effect sizes or very large effect sizes, you can upgrade by one or two levels. Um, and you can upgrade your evidence, you do a dose response, um, or if you can um, say that all plausible confounding would reduce your effect. Now, obviously, rating can go from low to very low pretty quickly if there's any um, criteria that are going to lead you to decrease um, your grade rating. Um, but in the absence of any significant um, criteria that would decrease your grade, you can then take a look and see if you can increase your grade rating. And you can get from low to moderate or to high with um, observational studies, uh, uh, you know, if, if you have a strong enough effect that you're looking at. And um, some more new evidence um, that Hassan's been working on is kind of taking that traditional research pyramid that we've seen, um, where we start with the case series and reports being at the bottom and the systematic review and the meta-analysis being the sine qua non of the evidence, the validity, is you now are thinking about looking at these different types of studies in a little bit more of a, a the wavy lines kind of give you an indication that you can have a very good randomized control or you can have a poor randomized control. But you can have observational studies that are poor quality or you can have observational qualities, studies that are high quality. And you take a look at sort of the revised pyramid of evidence here through the lens of a systematic review. And so rather than just saying, you know, the only thing that we're going to be able to do is look at randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews, is to take your review that you're using to underpin your guideline and really take a look at, you know, these different strata and how that can be, um, uh, help you make your, your decisions. And I think I'm just about out of time, so I just wanted to kind of call your attention to some grade groups and projects um, that are of interest to this group. And grade is always evolving. And um, I don't have any links for these because I didn't see anything live on the site, but they are working on how to evaluate observational studies. Um, they're looking at uh, ways to sort of get at rare diseases. Um, what I thought was kind of interesting is that they're also looking at ways now of evaluating evidence from animal studies. And we do know that not always, an animal study is not always going to be reflective of what happens in, in humans. We saw an example of that yesterday. Um, but there are definitely instances where you might have a handful of clinical trials, small scale or something. And you might have a bunch of animal evidence that sort of um, parallels it. And it would be interesting to see where grade lands eventually on, the, on coming down to uh, what we might be able to do um, down the road. And again, complex interventions, uh, looking, learning more about how um, Terrence and the uh, evidence for complex interventions is uh, right on point for um, some of the considerations within this group. I'm going to stop there, and I will now turn my screen back over, I think, to Cypress. Thank you very much.